Great, great to have, great to be together. Uh, Jason, before we start, Jason's just going to give you a few notices relevant to the children, so before they go out, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Um, we've got, uh, so for the children's work, so year six downwards, um, we have a sign-in sheet and a sign-out sheet, um, which uh, please can parents take their kids out. Uh, it's fantastic to see all the kids running, um, together out because they're so excited to do the kids work but we also want to um, see I also want to have good procedures in place so please take your children out make sure you sign the sheet and then go and collect them after the meeting um, our kids workers do a great job let's but let's please honor them and their time um, by get, collecting our kids and then bringing them back out fantastic and we've got the youth in today um, so if you're year seven upwards um, you're going to be in the service today and we've got some uh, some sheets for you to do um, which should be some fun uh, during the service so if you haven't got one of these please um, come and speak to me and I'll happily give you one and the final notice is um, about our light party on that's the level of excitement I can yeah I, I feel it um, we're gonna have a light party on Monday the 31st of October so instead of going to a rubbish Halloween party or trick-or-treating come and um, to our light party um, it will be about 6 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. venue to be confirmed um, I'm gonna put a sheet at the back because it's really important that we know the numbers so we can actually plan and buy stuff um, but it's gonna be loads of fun the theme is come dressed in armor um, so you can have let your imagination run wild with what sort of armor you're gonna wear and you never know we might be able to bend Jeff Moss's arm uh, to turn up in some sort of armour. <laughs> Thank you. The armour of God is the only armour I wear. Gareth, you're going, aren't you? <laughs> I thought you were going. Because we've done armour for you. Anyway, you may make an appearance. Enough frivolities. Let's pray and then encounter God in our time of worship. Do be free to participate. You can pray out loud from where you are. You can pray quietly. You feel you have a burning uh, portion of scripture to share with us that will strengthen us and edify us. You're very welcome to read that from where you are. If you feel God's giving you a spiritual gift or you want a testimony, come and chat with Duncan and myself at the front and we'll create an opening for you to do that. Let's just pray then. Father, we thank you for this privilege of being together this morning. We thank you, Lord God, for your goodness to us. And we have come this morning with a sole intent to proclaim our love and adoration for you, to declare who you are and all that you've done for us through Jesus Christ. So we ask you, Holy Spirit, be amongst us, strengthen and edify us, and be glorified. Amen. 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 Let's worship our great King.
joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. Let's shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. Let's shout out your praise. Let's shout out your praise. We were the beggars. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we run in free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were the beggars. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. Let's shout out your praise. Let's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. Let's shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. Let's shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. Let's shout out your praise. Let's shout out your praise. Let's shout out your praise. As the song says, let's shout out our praise to the Lord. In, in your own voice, in your own words, let's praise the, the Lord of heaven and earth. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Heavenly we thank Father, you, Lord, that thank you have gathered us in this place. Yes, Lord, we thank you, Lord God. Heavenly Lord, we are here, Lord, to praise your holy name, to worship you, God. To lift your name on high, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, come and touch each one of us here, Lord. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us, Lord Jesus. We want to see you. Lord, we want to praise your holy name this, this morning. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Praise is rising. find strength to face the day and in your presence all our fears are washed away washed away Hosanna Hosanna you are the God who saves us you're worthy of all our praise Hosanna, Hosanna, come have your way among us, we welcome you here, Lord Jesus, hear the sound, hear the sound of hearts returning. When we see you, we find strength to face the day. And 
in your presence all our fears are washed away washed away Hosanna Hosanna you are the God who saves us you're worthy of all our praises Hosanna Come have your way amongst us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. find strength to face the day and in your presence all our fears are washed away when we see you when we see you we find strength to face the day and in your presence all our fears are washed away Washed away, Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, you're worthy of all our praises, Hosanna, Hosanna, come have your way among we welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Come have your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Come have your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. shakes and crumble at your name the oceans roar and tumble at your name angels will bow the earth will rejoice the people cry out Lord of all the earth will shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord. At your name, at your name. The morning breaks in glory At your name Creation sings your story At your name Angels will bow The earth will rejoice Your people cry the earth will shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh, Yahweh, 
We love to shout your name, O oh Lord, Lord of all the earth. Lord of all the earth, we'll shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord. There is no one, there is no one like our God. We will praise you. There's no one like a God. We will sing, we will sing. There is no one like a God. We will praise you, praise you. Jesus is our God. We will sing. Lord of all the earth, Lord of all the earth, will shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with. Endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord. Lord of all the earth, Lord of all the earth, we'll shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to Shout your name, O oh Lord. Just the voices. Lord of all the earth, will shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord. Oh Lord, we love to sing your praises. We thank you that there is no one like you. You are the Lord of all the earth and you are our King and you are our Saviour. You are the God of salvation. And so we love to sing praise to you. You are worthy of our whole hearts, all our lives. And we want to offer up praises to you this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, thank you, God, that you are the God who saves. Thank you, Lord, you sent Jesus into this world to save us. No matter what we've done, we cannot atone for our sins, and yet Jesus took all of them upon the cross in order that we could have a full relationship with you. We thank you, God, for, for, that, for that love, for that outpouring of your, your grace and your mercy upon our lives, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that we can entrust those that do not know you in our families and our friends, that we know, Lord, that you are at work and that you, you want a relationship with them, Lord. We thank you, Lord, we can trust you for our futures, for their futures, Lord Jesus, mm-hmm. and that we can, we can reach out for them on their, beh- on their behalf, Lord, knowing that your grace is enough, and your grace has saved us, and you can reach out and touch yes, us. Lord. We thank ask you. you, Lord, to help us to understand your moves and your, uh, be, a, be a, aware of your Holy Spirit and, and respond to that, and help us not to to coil back and, and, and retract ourselves, but reach forward and step out in faith, knowing that you are with us, that you uh, are stronger and mightier than anything that we face. Thank you, Lord, that you are, and you know the plans, you have a, you have a plan of future for all of us, Lord, and uh, we thank you, Lord, that uh, in your hands it is good and wholesome. Thank you, Lord. In line to what Martin shared or prayed, that there's a great commission that's given to us to make disciples of all nations, uh, to reach out to the neighbors. Uh, it's so prophetic. Uh, the next song we're going to sing, it's a new song, it says there's a gospel that needs to be preached to the nations, to the neighbors, to our friends. It's a new song. Uh, Please feel free to join in. There 
is one gospel on which I stand for all eternity. It is my story, my father's plan. The Son has rescued me. Oh, what a gospel, what a peace. My highest joy and my deepest need. Now and forever He is my life. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. One gospel to which I cling All else I count as lost For there where justice and mercy me He saved me on the cross No more I boast in what I can bring No more I carry the weight of sin Bought me from death to life. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is one gospel. There is one gospel where hope is found. The empty tomb still speaks. For death could not keep my Savior down He lives and I am free Now on my Savior I fix my eyes My life is His and His hope is mine For He has promised I do will rise I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ gospel the church is one we do not walk alone we have his spirit as we press on to lead us safely home and when in glory still i will sing of this old story that rescued me Praise to my Savior, the King of life. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when in glory will I will sing of this whole story that rescued me. Praise to my Savior, the King of life. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise to my Savior, the King of life. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I stand in the gospel of Jesus How great 
precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a Amazing grace The Lord has promised The Lord has promised good to me His word my hope secure He will my shield and portion be as long as life endure my chains are gone i've been set free my god my savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love Amazing grace, my chains are gone. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love. Amazing grace. Father, we just want to acknowledge your amazing love, your unending grace. We sing these songs, Lord, because they're full of truth, because they raise our eyes to you. They make us realize just all that you've done <clears throat> for us and have yet to do. That's what worship is, Lord. It's focusing on you and telling you how great you are. And with the recipients of all these wonderful truths, we really cannot comprehend what unfailing love and unending grace is. We, we have a taste of it, and it leaves us blown away. And there's so much more to come. So we just bless you and thank you. We continue to worship you even in our notices, Lord God, and our time of communion. Amen. Do take your seats a minute. We're just going to share a couple of notices with you and we'll take communion together <clears throat> and then we'll sing a couple more verses of that amazing hymn to finish our first part of the morning. Notices, very important. What's happening this week? Excellent. You see, that's why we need to do this. Life group. You've got life group this week, so some of you I know haven't been yet because you've been away, so you're looking forward to that. And then we've got the membership course starting this week, and if you're not signed up for that and you'd like to know more about what it means to become a member and why we do membership, uh, have a chat with me afterwards. I have the privilege of leading that. Also, if you are not in a life group but would like to enjoy some fellowship, around uh, some of them do food <clears throat> i'll tell you which one thursday thursdays <laughs> don't do anything else they just eat the rest of us pray and talk about jesus and you know open the bible uh do, do see duncan if you'd like to be part of a life group uh okay we're going to take communion in a moment so perhaps those who have asked could take their positions two of you there and one couple over there 
Sorry, you go that side with Alison, Flavia and uh, Carol. It's the other side, sweet. <laughs> Saying nothing. When we come together to take communion, it's not a religious duty. It's a privilege. It's a privilege and it's a statement of who we are as a people, both individually and corporately. So this time is for those who know Jesus Christ personally as their Lord and Saviour. If you're not in that place, then you're very welcome to be with us. But just don't participate because it doesn't mean anything to you. So that's okay. We respect your integrity in doing that. But for those of us who are Christians in the biblical sense of knowing Jesus personally, this is a time when we do three things. You can do many things, but for me it's easy to remember these three. It's a time we look back. We look back at Jesus giving his life on the cross so that you and I can be stand before God sinless with sins, all our sins forgiven. We were unable to pay the penalty for our sin. So Jesus came as the sinless one and took that penalty for us and then rose from the dead. So it's a time to look back and remember and be thankful for all that he's done. But it's also a time to look around because what he did on the cross was bring together a family, create a new family in God. And that's you and I, different backgrounds, different experiences, but actually one family before God. So it's good to look around and remember that we should be in unity of heart and mind with one another. And so any area of unforgiveness in our hearts towards one another needs to be brought before the Lord before we should take communion. And then also, this is a proclamation, as Corinthians tells us, that actually we are declaring that the Lord is returning again. And this is when all uh, demons and Satan shudder as we proclaim Jesus will return. And so it's a proclamation as we look forward and we strengthen our own souls for whatever we're going through right now, there'll be a day when the heaven cracks open and Jesus returns. Exciting, isn't it? So we look back in thankfulness, we look around with humility and gratitude for one another and we look ahead in joy and confidence of what is yet to come. So whilst we're doing this, if you'd like to go to either of these two couples, uh, and take your communion, they'll serve you, I'll just pray. And then perhaps whilst we pray, um, whilst we're doing this, you guys could play that wonderful song again, just slowly in the background. Father, we just say to you, thank you, that a simple bit of juice or wine, in this case juice, and a little piece of bread is such a proclamation, is such a statement and declaration of who you are, what you've done, what you've made us to be and what you have yet to do. And we thank you for the privilege of being part of this. And we offer it to you with grateful hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake together as a family, shall we? Just go to either side.
Thanks, guys. Just to remind you, although we're not getting the waft just yet, we have some awesome food ready to uh, partake with together afterwards. So we do invite you to stay on, have some lunch with us. We've got an assortment. Uh, I don't really know what we've got, but anyway, I know it's going to be great. So we're going to feed you physically, but now the highlight of our week, we're going to be fed spiritually as Duncan comes to bring God's word. Let's pray as we come to read from God's holy word. Heavenly Father, I don't know about this being the highlight of our week, but we do love to read your word together as the church. We do love to hear from you. I thank you that you are a God who has revealed himself to us. You've told us your name so that we might praise and worship you and be in relationship with you. And you've also given us your word in the Bible so that we can understand more about you, grow in our knowledge and love for Jesus, our Lord and Saviour, and grow as Christians as well. And so, Lord, I just pray that that is what would happen during this time, that you would move, you would speak, and we would grow in Christ. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm excited this morning to preach to you, to share with you a love story. Isn't that exciting? A love story. Admittedly, a rather bizarre and quite unusual love story that we're going to read together this morning, but a love story all the same, because I'm preaching from Ruth chapter 3 and the story of Ruth proposing to Boaz. We've been in a Ruth sermon series. Um, So over the last couple of weeks, I've preached on the first two chapters of this story. You can go online and watch or listen to those sermons. But um, we're in Ruth chapter three today. But before I read that story, before I read to you the love story from Ruth three, you're going to need some context to understand what's going on in Ruth chapter 3. In fact, I'm going to go all the way back to Genesis. I'm not going to go through every chapter of the Bible from Genesis all the way through, but I am going to give you some context before I read from Ruth chapter 3. So let's go back to Genesis. When God created Adam and Eve, he gives them a purpose. And the purpose that he gives to Adam and Eve, this is what God says to Adam and Eve, is be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. So in the Old Testament, one of the central purposes of humanity, one of the central purposes of marriage was to have kids, to be fruitful and to fill the earth with the human race. Now, let me just give you a very quick aside. Um, In the New Testament, in the Great Commission, Jesus switches that up. He changes it around in a sense. We no longer necessarily need to be fruitful by having children in the New Testament, but we are fruitful by making disciples. This is what Jesus says in the New Testament, in the Great Commission, go and make disciples. And so we, it's not physical reproduction, it's spiritual reproduction by sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And if you are not a Christian here this morning, you are so welcome, thank you for being here, but we wanna share with you the good news of Jesus Christ. And this is that news, that God loves you, that he wants you to come into a relationship with him. And because he loves you, because he wants to be in relationship with you, he sent a saviour in his son, Jesus. He died on the cross for the forgiveness of sins and he rose again in glory to new life. And all who trust in Christ are reconciled with God the Father. And so if you're not a Christian, I would urge you this morning Come be made a disciple in a sense this morning. Believe in Christ and receive salvation. Enter into the love of God. And if you're a Christian, you have a purpose. Right at the heart of who you are should be this great commission that Christ has given to all his disciples. He's given to you that you might be fruitful by making disciples, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Anyway, that was an aside. I'm off track. Let's get back in the Old Testament and back to the purpose of God to get married and have children that that God gives to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. But that leaves me with a big question. 
if that is one of the purposes of humanity, what happens when a husband dies, leaving a wife without any children? That's what's happened in the book of Ruth so far, in Ruth chapter 1 and Ruth chapter 2. The tragedy of chapter 1, there's a famine in the land of Egypt, and Marlon, the son of Naomi, the husband of Ruth, dies, and his brother Kilion also dies. So there's a tragedy, and Ruth is, is left without a husband and without any children. But Ruth lovingly stays and cares for her mother-in-law, Naomi. Ruth returns with Naomi to the town of Bethlehem. And although she is left husbandless and childless, she devotes herself to serving this lady, Naomi. Now that must have been very painful and difficult for Ruth, imagining what the future would hold for her. Is the rest of her life just going to be serving and looking after Naomi? Is that what God has for her forever? It must have been a painful and difficult time. There might even have been a sense of failure within her. Well, if God's purpose is, is that we'd be fruitful and multiply, well, I haven't, that hasn't happened for me, Ruth might think, in the middle of this story. What's going to happen? What's going to happen to her? Well, fortunately for Ruth, there is a law that God provides to the Israelite people that speaks directly into her situation. I'm going to read to you from Deuteronomy 25, and I'm going to read verses 5 and 6. This is what God says. If brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to a stranger, her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And the first son whom she bears shall succeed to the name of his dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. Now that's probably quite a strange law to our modern day ears, but it's a law of provision for Ruth that she might not live her whole life childless, that she, she might not feel this sense of failure her whole life, but there's a provision, a way of her bearing children, and the child that she bears will continue the family name. Now, I believe everything that happens in Ruth chapter 3 that I'm about to read to you is a consequence of that law, is a living out of that law. And so this bizarre proposal, the story that I'm about to read, flows from applying that law to Ruth's situation. So let's read Ruth chapter 3 and this bizarre love story, this bizarre pro proposal. Then Naomi, Ruth's mother-in-law, said to Ruth, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? Is not Boaz our relative, with whose young women you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Wash, therefore, and anoint yourself. Put on your cloak and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he is finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. And she replied, All that you say, I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over and behold, a woman lay at his feet. He said, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. And he said, may you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first, in that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask, for all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. And now it is true that I am a redeemer, yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. Remain tonight, and in the morning, if he will redeem you, good, let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until the morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, but arose before no one could recognise another. And he said, let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. And he said, bring the garment you're wearing and hold it out. So she held it, and he measured out six measures of barley and put it on her. 
and when she went, uh, then she went into the city. And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, How did you fare, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, These six measures of barley he gave to me, for he said, You must not go, em you must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. She replied, Wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. Well, how does this story speak to us in 2022? It feels so far removed from our dating culture and the way we do relationships, doesn't it? Well, does it have anything at all to say to us in this day and age? Well, I believe that it does. I believe that this passage of scripture that I just read to you speaks to us about the transforming power of God. I believe that that story I've read to you speaks to us about the covenant of marriage. I believe it speaks to us about the covenant love of God for his people. I believe it speaks to us as uh, into purity and what righteousness looks like. And I think it also reveals Boaz as a redeemer. And Boaz as a redeemer points to God and Christ as our redeemer. So I think there's loads in there. It might sound like a really weird story, but I think there's loads in there to unpack. And I wanna unpack this story with three sections this morning. The first section I've called the transformation of Naomi. The second section is Ruth's proposal. And the third section is Boaz's righteousness. So let's start by thinking about the transformation of Naomi. I don't know if you followed the series so far, isn't it extraordinary how much Naomi has been transformed by chapter three? Do you remember chapter one? Naomi was talking to Ruth and, and Naomi was saying to Ruth, don't come with me. Don't stay with me. Go back to Moab. Go back to your foreign gods. Go back to your home and find a husband in Moab. Don't come with me. Naomi says to Ruth, I have nothing to offer you. I have no hope. She says, it is exceedingly bitter to me what has happened to me. So in chapter one, Naomi is hopeless and wants Ruth to desert her and leave her alone. In the grief of her husband dying and her sons dying, she has no hope and no plan. But in chapter two, God showed his kindness to Naomi and Ruth. He provided for this family with the food that they needed. Ruth has been faithful to Naomi. She was stubborn. She says, no, I'm coming with you. I'm staying with you. And now in chapter three, Naomi is transformed. Now Naomi wants to help Ruth. She has a plan. It's a slightly odd plan, but she has a plan to help her daughter-in-law, Ruth. If you're going through um, grief now in your life, God wants you to know he will turn this around for good, just like he does with Naomi. He turns her around, he transforms her, he heals her in a sense. And you know, we can know as Christians that God works in all things for the good of those who love him. Isn't that just a tremendous, tremendous promise? I really believe that when we go through challenges and struggles, God transforms us and helps us so that one day we come to a place where just like Naomi, we can show compassion and care for others. We go through suffering and we receive the comfort from God in order that we might then comfort and help others. And this is what's happened to Naomi. She's been transformed into one who has no hope and now she is one who's seeking the good for Ruth. She wants to help her daughter-in-law. And so she says in verse one, my daughter, should I not seek rest for you that it may be well with you? You can see the care in Naomi for Ruth. You can see the compassion and the love in that first verse, in that offer. Now we know that in that verse, in verse one, Naomi is talking about marriage. She's talking about marriage and she describes marriage as rest and says it will be for Ruth's good. I want you to get married so that it will be well for you. Now, just so you know, I asked Rachel whether she thought of marriage to me as being restful, and she asked me whether I was joking. So there's obviously um, some things that I need to work on as a, as a husband. You know, the Bible describes singleness as a gift. The Apostle Paul, speaking of his singleness in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 7 says, I wish that all were as myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. 
And Jesus Christ himself, of course, lived a celibate single life while he was here on the earth. So we know that singleness is a good gift from God. And we have some wonderful single people in this church. But here in this verse, Naomi speaks about marriage as a gift. And in particular, she speaks of marriage as a gift for wives. Marriage should be a rest for wives in that a wife comes under the love care, comfort, protection, and provision of a husband. That's what this story, in chapter three and chapter four, this is what this story is about, is Ruth coming under the care, comfort, protection, and provision of Boaz. To be at rest as a wife in your marriage, to say, I know with this man, I am safe, I am loved, I am comforted, he has concern from me. And so I think this verse is a challenge for husbands. I, I think this husband offers us as husbands, offers us as husbands a crucially important but challenging question. Are you labouring to love, care, cherish and protect your wife so that she can truly say, I am at rest with him? Being married to this man is restful in some sense for me. Perhaps, this might be dangerous, but I'm going to do this, right? Perhaps tonight you ought to ask your wives, how can I make marriage more restful for you as husbands? That would be a good question to ask your wife, husbands. And hopefully you get a slightly more helpful answer than I got initially when I suggested to Rachel that marriage should be a rest. Wives, if you have such a husband as Boaz, one who does make marriage restful, I would encourage you're to see, I would encourage you to see your marriage as a gift from God that is for your good, that it may go, go well with you. That's what Naomi, Naomi has lost her husband. Her husband's died and she's left a widow, but she still knows that marriage is a good gift for a wife. And so she said she, she wants Ruth to enter into this rest and that it might go well with her. And so if you're a wife in that situation, be thankful to God for your spouse. Now, since this passage speaks so positively about marriage, I don't want to dwell on how sin corrupts this beautiful picture of rest and goodness. But we know that that's true, that many marriages are corrupted and made difficult through sin. And so all I'll say is this, if, if you read this verse, and for you it's a painful and sad verse, because that's not your experience of marriage, please come and seek prayer come and speak to someone you trust in the room, come and speak to me if you'd like. We'd love to help you, we'd love to pray with you, we'd love to pastor you through pain. I appreciate that that verse, for some people they're going, actually God has blessed me. I've got uh, an okay husband who's doing all right, or I've got a fantastic wife, and you think, brilliant, fantastic. But for others that verse might be painful, and we don't want to leave you left just to wander home, so please come and ask for prayer. Naomi sees that marriage is a good gift. And so she comes up with a plan for Ruth that she would go and propose to Boaz. He is a relative. He can fulfill Deuteronomy 25. He can be a redeemer and they can get married and have children and continue the family name. And so Naomi comes up with this plan. You need to wash. You need to have a bath, Ruth. You need to anoint yourself with oil. You need to put on some nice clothes, Ruth. You need to scrub yourself up. And then you need to go down to the threshing floor and you need to see where Boaz will lie down and then wait until the men have finished eating and drinking and gone to bed. And then I want you to lie at Boaz's feet, uncover the feet, and then he's going to wake up at some point, presumably because his feet are cold, and he's going to tell you what to do. What a great plan, Naomi. In no way should this plan serve as an example for how single ladies should seek a husband in this church. I feel like I just need to say that just in case anyone's thinking, this is my new plan that I'm going to take on board. Um, in fact, if you listen to sermons on Ruth chapter 3, some preachers spend their entire sermon criticising Naomi and say, saying that Naomi's plan was sinful. She, she, some preachers think that Naomi dresses Ruth up nice to seduce Boaz so they can have sex and then Boaz would have to marry her. That's how some people interpret this passage. That's how bizarre the plan is and how weird the plan is. Um, now, I want to see Naomi's plan a little bit more charitably than that. I think, I, I, don't, I say again, it's not a plan to copy at all, but I think that Naomi trusts in Boaz's character and Boaz's righteousness. 
and she knows nothing untoward is going to happen because of the righteousness of this man who is well known for his love for God. And I think she creates a proposal moment with beautiful theological imagery. We're going to unpack some of that beautiful theological imagery. So I want to read Naomi's plan a bit charitably. I don't think this is a go on, seduce him, have sex with him, then he'll have to marry you. I think this is, we know Boaz. I know he's not going to do anything wrong here. And I want to, I, I'm going to create a moment for Boaz and Ruth together. So now then, let's look at Ruth's proposal in verses 7 to 11. Ruth does exactly as Naomi has told her. She lies down at Boaz's feet, she uncovers his feet, and she waits for him to wake up. And at midnight, Boaz is startled, and he does wake up. I really enjoy that verse in the story. He's startled. Behold, there's a woman at his feet. I just imagine that moment for Boaz. What is going on here? And he says, who are you? That's, that's what, but that, I don't know whether that, that's the question Ruth really wanted to hear in that moment. Who are you? But that's the question she gets asked. Who are you? And Ruth answers in verse 9. And we're going to look in, at verse 9 in more detail in a second. But look first with me at verse 10. So Ruth answers the question, who are you? And then Boaz says... This kindness, Ruth, that you are showing is greater than the first. You have not gone after younger men, whether poor or rich. You've shown kindness to me. You've shown kindness to Naomi by keeping marriage within the family. And you've shown kindness to your late husband. You're following the commands of Deuteronomy 25. This proposal, Ruth, that you have offered is a great kindness to lots and lots of different people. And essentially what Boaz's response in verse 10 tells us is that this is precisely how he's interpreted what Ruth has done. Ruth has proposed in verse 9. That's how he understands what Ruth says in verse 9. And of course, Boaz's answer is a, is a bit of a mixture, isn't it? It's kind of, yes, I, saw, I sort of want to, but there's a relative who's closer. And so we need to ask him first and then we'll follow the commands of God. But let's look at the words Ruth uses when she proposes. I wonder whether there's anyone who's been proposed to in the room who can remember the words that were spoken to you in, in that moment. I, Rachel's shaking her head and I can't remember what I said either. All I know is that I was knelt down in the sand on a beach and my, my knee was getting very covered with wet sand. Um, but it was, a love, it was a wonderful moment. It was a beautiful moment, but we can't remember what was said. I wonder whether there's anyone who can remember the words that were said. That's a, a, an amazing, beautiful moment, isn't it, the proposal? This is what Ruth says when she proposes. Firstly, she says, I am Ruth, your servant. And again, in the second sentence, she uses the word servant to describe herself. I think this is why she's been told to lie at Boaz's feet. It's a sign of submission. It's a sign of servant heartedness. I'm lying here because I know I want to serve you as a husband. This is one of the reasons why Ruth is such a hero of the Old Testament. She's always looking to serve. Isn't that what happened in chapter one? Naomi's left by herself and Ruth says, I want to serve you, I want to love you. She's got such a servant heart. In chapter two, Ruth's the one who volunteers to go and glean food so that Ruth and Naomi can continue to eat. She loves to serve. And here now in chapter three, she's lying at Boaz's feet saying, I'm Ruth, your servant. And she calls herself a servant again. Ruth should serve as an example to us on what servant heartedness really looks like. And I said this last week, but I'll say it again. Jesus Christ is also one who came to serve. And so if he is our Lord, if he is our king, if we follow him, then our lives should look like the lives of a servant. We love to bless other people. So that's the first thing Ruth says. I am Ruth, your servant. And then the second thing she says is spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. Now, the word that Ruth use, uses for wings can also mean corners of a garment. And so this is why Ruth has uncovered Boaz's feet. Boaz was probably lying under his garment, under his cloak, and his feet are getting cold. And so the idea is that Boaz would respond by saying yes and use his garment to cover up Ruth as, he, as she lays at his feet. Do you remember last week where Boaz uses very, very similar language to speak to Ruth? Ruth says to Boaz when she's gleaning from his field, why have I found favour in your sight? 
And this is how Boaz responds. The Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. So when Ruth uses these words, spread your wings over me that I might take refuge, uh, spread your wings over your servant, she's reflecting back theological words that Boaz has already spoken to Ruth. I think there's a romantic element here, isn't there? These are words that you've spoken to me and comforted me with, the refuge of God, the wings of Christ over me, and now I'm going to use these words to also ask for your hand in marriage. I just think, I think there's something beautifully theologically romantic. I wasn't that theological when I proposed, but maybe I wish I was because there's something romantic about that. But there's also a deep theological element to what Ruth says. Ruth understands that just as God shelters and protects and loves all who come to him, this is the gospel, isn't it? Come to God by faith in Jesus Christ and God will shelter you. He will wrap his wings around you. He will offer you loving protection even into eternity. If you are a Christian here, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, God has his wings around you forever and ever and ever and he will never let you go. He will never remove his wings. He will never remove his love and protection for you. This is the good news of Christianity, but Ruth understands just as God shelters, protects and loves, so good husbands are a picture of the gospel since they take their wives under their provision and their care. And so my hope and prayer is, is, is that as we look at the husbands in this church, though they may not be perfect, in their love and kindness for their wife, they are showing the gospel. They're showing the love of Christ. They're showing the care of Christ. Husbands, another challenge for you. I wonder whether people would look at you and the way you conduct yourself in your marriage and say there is a picture of the refuge that God gives to all Christians. Now, just to show you that I haven't made this idea up of God spreading his wings over his children, I want to read from Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 8 to 14. Ezekiel 16, 8 to 14. This is God speaking to the nation of Israel. And this is what he says. When I passed by you again and saw you, behold, you were at the age for love. And I spread the corner of my garment or my wings over you and covered your nakedness. I made a vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord God, and you became mine. Then I bathed you with water and washed off the blood from you and anointed you with oil. I clothed you also with embroidered cloth and shod you with fine leather. I wrapped you in fine linen and covered you with silk. And I adorned you with ornaments and put bra bracelets on your wrists and a chain on your neck. And I put a ring on your nose and earrings in your ears and a beautiful crown on your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver and your clothing was of fine linen and silk and embroidered cloth. You ate fine flour and honey and oil. You grew exceedingly beautiful and advanced to royalty and your renown went forth among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect through the splendour that I had bestowed on you, declares the Lord God. Do you see God uses a metaphor to describe his entire relationship with the nation Israel? And he says, I am like a loving husband to you, Israel. And I've taken my garment, I've taken my wings, and I've spread them over you. And I've provided for you and given you everything you need so that you should shine with beauty. And other nations look in and say, see how beautiful this nation of Israel is. Such is the provision and kindness of God for this nation. He is such a glorious husband and therefore God will receive the worship and the adoration due his name because of his kindness, because of his compassion passion because of his wings wrapped around Israel, his wife, because of his garment covering her up. God is like a husband in the way he loves his people and he's covered his people with his garment as wings over them. And this, I think, is the primary thing we should take away from Ruth chapter 3. Not that Naomi comes with a, comes up with a slightly bizarre plan. Not that Ruth is very servant-hearted, although she is. 
This is the primary thing we should take from Ruth 3 isn't a challenge to husbands, but rather the primary thing we need to take away from Ruth 3, Ruth 3 is the covenant love of God. Like a husband, like a perfect husband's love for his wife. So is God towards you and me. I wonder whether you've whether truly lived in that picture of God's love for you and love for us together as his people. Such is his care, such is his concern. God loves you so deeply and so wonderfully. You know, every day I'm learning just how deeply God loves me. And this picture is part of that lesson, part of this growth. And I want us daily to be growing in understanding of just how much God loves us. Hey, we've got the youth in this morning. I want to say to you, youth, do you know that tomorrow, not just this morning when you're in church, is God loving you, but tomorrow when you're in school, God so loves you. He's watching over you. He goes with you. He's spreading his wings over you and being with you, showing you great love in every place that you go. And so in this story, so in this story, Boaz becomes a picture of the love of God spreading his garment, spreading his wings over Ruth as God spreads his wings and spreads his garment over his people. Now next week, we're going to consider in more detail how Boaz is, as a redeemer, a picture of Christ, the ultimate redeemer. He di Christ dies on the cross in order to redeem us from the law, in order to redeem us from slavery to sin. He rescues us and we're going to focus on that next week. So I'm going into what I'm going to talk about next week in, in Ruth chapter 4. But Boaz shows us a picture of Christ. We look at Boaz as a redeemer and we see Jesus, our awesome redeemer, who has saved us. But given that Boaz is a picture of Christ, a picture of God, it's so important, my third and final point today. My third section, Boaz is righteousness. Chapter 3, Ruth 3 ends with Boaz doing all the right things. He does not sleep with or rape Ruth in this environment. He is pure. Did you know in chapter 2, when we read Ruth chapter 2, there are two references to men assaulting women. And those references are put in chapter 2 deliberately so that when we come to Ruth chapter 3, we see how different Boaz is, is in his righteousness. The other men in Israel are not holy men. They are aggressive men and they do terrible things to ladies in Israel. But not Boaz. Boaz is pure and good and righteous and treats Ruth with the honour and the respect that she needs. There's a remarkable contrast that here in this moment, at midnight, in the middle of the night, Boaz is pure and honourable. The second thing we see about Boaz is that Boaz obeys God's law concerning redeemers. So in verse 12, Boaz says there's another redeemer who's closer. And I can imagine Boaz's heart at this moment. Boaz's heart is going, I want to marry you, Ruth. I really, really do. But... There is a closer relative and we've got to obey God's law. And so we're going to have to go through the right steps here. I'm going to have to talk to this guy and ask if he wants to redeem you um, before me. And I can imagine Boaz's heart going, no, I just want to say, yeah, I just want to get married. You know, it's, it's interesting, isn't it, that he doesn't wait around the next morning. Boaz is straight away to go and sort the issue. That's what Naomi says. Boaz isn't going to wait, Ruth. Don't worry. He's going to get this sorted today. Um, so you can imagine in this moment, Boaz wants to say just yes immediately, but actually he says, we must obey the law of God. Boaz also shows his righteousness in verse 13. He promises he will redeem her if, if this other redeemer says no. He doesn't leave Ruth thinking, oh, if the first guy says no, then Boaz might say no as well. He doesn't leave Ruth fretting and worrying, but Ruth is compassionate towards her and says, as the Lord lives, I will redeem you if this other guy doesn't. In verse 14, Boaz sends Ruth on her way early to protect her reputation and once again shows his glorious righteousness. And in verse 15, Ruth, uh, Boaz sends Ruth with an abundance of food. She's not going to have to work today. She has the food that she needs and she goes back to Naomi with so much stuff. And so in every way in Ruth chapter 3, Boaz is shown to be righteous. He's pure. He's good. He's kind. Isn't that the way Boaz has been portrayed throughout this story? He's righteous. He's kind. He's caring. And in this sense, he is an excellent picture of God, our Redeemer, who stretches out his garment 
and invites us to believe in him, worship him and come under his protection and love. Do you know there are some people, some non-Christians, some unbelievers who think if there is a God, he must be wicked and unkind. I wonder whether you've ever spoken to a non-Christian who's thought like that or watched, um, there's a video of Stephen Fry doing the rounds on Twitter at the moment of him saying if God does exist, he must be really, really unkind and cruel. Well, Stephen Fry hasn't really read the Bible and understood the God of this book, the God who we know, the God who we love and worship. They, someone who thinks that might think that coming under God's wings is all about control, is all about restriction, is all about ruining our lives. But again, that is not who God is. That is not the God who I know and love and worship. Do you know his kindness knows no bounds? God's kindness knows no bounds. His love is steadfast and immovable. It's not like this morning because you're in church, God loves you 100%, but later on when you mess up, he loves you 90% and slowly it depletes until you get to Saturday evening and you're at one or 2%. No, God is steadfast and immovable. He loves you 100%, 100% of the time because that's who he is. It comes out of who he is. He's the God of love. His protection is impenetrable. He is the Lord who provides. He will always give you the things that you need. He is gentle and kind in everything that he does. I love the Lord, but I know that his love for me surpasses my love for him because he is such a loving and glorious God. His judgments are true. When he speaks, it's always true and it's always good. And his instructions to us are always for our good. Do you know why God gives us instructions in the Bible? It's because he loves us and he wants the best for us. He cares about us. What kind of dad never gives any instructions to their children whatsoever? That's not a good dad. That's a, God, that's a dad who's failing to love. But our God gives us instructions because he loves us and he cares for us. And his instructions are always for our good. And so to come under the wings of our God is to truly find rest. And not just any old rest, but an eternal rest that will go on forever, knowing God and enjoying his love and kindness day by day, forever and ever. To come under God's wings means it will go well with you. It doesn't mean you won't ever suffer or go through difficulty, but God will work in all things for your good. So it will go well with you if you come to trust in our Lord. Naomi's picture of marriage in verse 1 turns out to actually be a picture of our relationship with God. And so we are so blessed by our awesome God as we shelter under his magnificent wings of love and kindness. Can I speak to you if you're not a Christian again? The best thing in my life unquestionably is God that he loves me forever, that he is always with me. I have lots of good gifts in this life, but the very best thing is God. And it's not close. It's not close. He's so gloriously wonderful. So gloriously wonderful. If you're not a Christian, I urge you, believe in Christ. Enter into a relationship. Be reconciled with God the Father and you will never regret it because God is so, so good. And if you are a Christian, isn't it a glorious salvation we have received? Don't we have a magnificent, loving God? Let's Let's love being under his wings. Let's love being close to him in relationship with him through prayer and through all of life, really, God being with us, through the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Let's enjoy that. Let's love that because God loves us. I'm going to pray for us. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I want to thank you that being under your wings, coming to trust in you, is a place of rest. We don't need to work that you would love us more because you, always, you already love us 100%. We know that you shelter us and you protect us and you keep us under the shadow of your wings, not just today, but into eternity forever and ever. And we know that that place is a place of receiving from your love, kindness, provision, comfort, compassion. And so we want to say, Lord, we love you. We love you so much. Thank you for this offer of shelter 
in the person of Jesus Christ. He died for us on the cross and rose again in power. Thank you for that. We love you so much. Uh, Lord, but we thank you that our love pales in comparison to your love that you have bestowed on us. And Lord, we, we just want to say, may every day we enjoy and love this place of rest that we have come to under the shelter of your wings. Help us live in that place of closeness to you in all that we do and say. Every breath that we breathe is a breath breathed under the shelter and in the refuge of your garment, under the corners of your garment and under your wings. And we love that, Lord. What a place to do life. And so we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm not going to ask for a formal response, really, um, after I've preached this morning. I hope that your hearts are warmed by how compassionate and wonderful our God is. But I have touched on some tricky issues in places. And so if you would like to grab someone for prayer, then please do that. If you'd like to pray quietly by yourself, please do that as well. Or you want to grab someone nearby who you trust, um, who you know. Um, let this be a place of prayer. Even as we gather as the back, at the back to have tea and coffee together and enjoy fellowship. And if you're a visitor, we'd love you to join us for tea and coffee. And we'd also love you to join us for lunch as well. I don't know quite how it's going to work, but at some point people start moving around, putting out tables and delivering food to various places and we'll work it out as we go. But um, yeah, please do stay for tea and coffee at the back. Prayer is available if you need it. Um, but otherwise, have a great weekend and God bless you all. We're going to end our meeting there.